Hello, it's Mark Lanier coming to you this morning at a new time for some of you because we're starting at 9.30 in the morning, effective today. And those of you who may not have known that, who've kind of gotten used to that 11 o'clock, we'll be doing 11 o'clock to replay this. Uh, and so uh, you can see it again if you want. Uh, but anyway, this is the 24th week of teaching during this coronavirus mess, the 24th week that we've been away from our church home where this class normally teaches. Now I'm excited because I hope in the middle of September we get back to our church home and we'll be teaching still live on the internet and recorded for those who watch it later, but um, we'll also be open for people to attend live. More about that when those dates get totally firmed up in cement. I'm also excited because starting September 20th, I'm going to start a new series on the law. And it's the law like you've never seen it before. Never understood it before, I hope. Because I grow as I learn these things to teach, but it's going to be a fantastic opportunity for us to explore the character of God by understanding the law which through which he expressed his character. But this morning, we've got time for something a little bit different that will be this morning, and I suspect I'll follow up next week and maybe even the following week. So this morning, we're going to be talking about singing, and I'm really glad you're here. Now, singing is something that everybody does. It's one of the most ubiquitous, meaning found everywhere, activities of humanity. It's found from as early as one year old, children start singing at the age of one, throughout the rest of life, and it's been found in all civilizations through all time. So you can sing in a choir, you can sing when you're old, you can sing when you're young, you can sing when you're by yourself, you can sing while you do chores. By the way, Amy Grant's song, Baby, Baby, she wrote that song as much as the pop world would like to think it was about some hunk of a fella she might have been married to or something. Baby, Baby is a song she wrote holding her infant in her arms while she was vacuuming. Baby, baby, I'm taken with the notion. And it's got the real vacuum feel to it. You can sing in all sorts of times and, and all sorts of places. And that's something I want us to talk about this morning. So the singing class is divided up into, I should have done four parts. It would have been more harmonic, but we only have three. So for the first part of this lesson is the biblical instructions about singing. The second part of the lesson, we're going to look at a little bit of the historical practice of singing. And then the third part of the lesson are going to be some practical exercises. Now, no, that does not mean I'm going to, to have you do scales or something like that. But we will look at just some practical ways to implement the teachings about singing. So let's start with biblical instruction. Now, the Bible actually tells you and me to sing. It does. I've got here on the Elmo an instruction to sing. And if you look at it, you'll see Psalm 96, 1 through 4. It says, oh, sing. Sing. Shiru in the, the Hebrew is, is the imperative form of that word. That means it's an order. That's an order, chief. That's an instruction. That's a you do this. It also happens to be in the plural form. So uh, it, where I come from in Lubbock, we could translate that y'all sing. Oh, sing y'all to the Lord a new song. Sing, again in the imperative, shiru, to the Lord all the earth. Sing, again, an instruction, 
Shiru, to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. By the way, this is just a, if you've been following my classes, you know I've got a few pet peeves. Things that I teach over and over and over again because we really, really need to grasp them. And one of them is the name of God. When it is written in all capitals, that's a sign that it's the actual name God gave Moses for Israel, Yahweh. And it's translated, the King James would translate it Jehovah. But it is sing to the Lord using his name. That means when you've got it in here and it says, sing to the Lord, followed by bless his name, you know the name is Lord, what I've done in green. Lord, Lord, Yahweh, Yahweh, bless his name. Now here's the little mark, can't get this, say it enough. Shem is the word name in Hebrew, and it doesn't just mean a label. It's not just your identifier. Name, Shem, that word in Hebrew references who you are. It's your core, what you've done. It's your resume, your curriculum vitae. It's, 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 so, so the, the psalmist is not saying, bless his name, like, oh, Yahweh's a great name. It's saying, bless his name. In other words, bless, honor, praise what God has done and who God is. That's why it's followed up in this parallel structure by tell, which is bless, of his salvation from day to day. That's his name. That's who he is. That's what he's done. God has saved us day to day. So this is instruction to declare his glory among the nations. That's who he is. His marvelous works, what he's done. He's great. He's greatly to be praised, feared above all the other gods. This is an instruction to sing. It's not found only in the Psalms. Paul says it in Ephesians. Paul says it in Colossians. Here's the Colossians passage. Let the word of Christ dwell. It's a combination of two Greek words, in and oiko. In oikeo is the verb form here, and it's in an imperative. It means live inside. Oiko is a house. Um, in means in. So in the, in, let, it, let Christ live in your house of you richly. By the way, also in an imperative form there on in oikeo, uh, let the word of Christ dwell in you. Let him live inside you richly. How does that mean, Paul? What do you mean? Well, by teaching a participle, admonishing one another in all wisdom, and what else, Paul? Singing another participle, psalms. You can sing Psalm 96. You can sing lots of psalms. Sing hymns. Those are hymnos in the, in the Greek are just uh, uh, songs of, of meaning and import. And so he groups it with spiritual songs. Those are songs that are, are uh, uh, inspired by the Spirit, are uh, uh, spiritually oriented and focused and do it with thankfulness in your hearts to God. That's an instruction to sing. And we should be singing because it's important for us to sing. Look at another instruction and see the importance of singing here. This is Psalm 66. Shout for joy to God, all the earth, Sing, again, shiru, it's the imperative, the glory of his name. Now, remember, name 
is a reference to his character and who he is and what he's done. That's his resume. That's his stud sheet. So if we're going to sing to the glory of his name and give to him glorious praise, how are we going to do it? We're going to say to him, how awesome are your deeds? What you've done is awesome. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you, sing praises to your name. And this is to your name, who you are, what you've done. By the way, this is going to be so important to us in a, as starting September 20th where we look at the law. If we understand this idea of the name of God is his character and who he is and what he's done, then that Ten Commandments not to take his name in vain is going to explode in meaning to us as we work through it. So if we go back to the PowerPoint, we are told by the Bible to sing. And you've got examples of singing over and over and over in Scripture. I've pulled out just a couple of them to show you this morning. Here is Exodus 15. Moses singing. A lot of people are like, Moses singing? Yeah, we have been singing since before recorded time. In the sense that before humanity was writing, the, the, the archaeologists are able to find from the most primitive cultures and societies various instruments for making noise. Whether it's an animal skin over a tree trunk or something for, for a drum or whatever it may be. The, uh, the, we can't find a society. Anthropologists cannot find a society that doesn't have singing. Exodus 15, 1 and 2, the song of Moses. And this is just the start. This song goes the whole chapter. Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord because he's triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider he's thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God. I will praise him. My father's God. I will exalt him. And you've got this extended song that's there. There are more songs in, in the, the, the biblical text, and I'm going to get to them in a little bit. But before I do, I want to talk for you uh, with a moment about why we sing. One is... We, we were told to sing by God, but why? One of the things I love about living in the 21st century is science is unfolding more and more and more of God's creation. And science is explaining to us more and more and more not only how God has done some things, but also why things are so important. And this is one great example because science has taught us some things about singing that we might not have known before. But when we understand this, we begin to understand why it's so important that we do what God tells us. It reminds me of um, my children who are now adults. But when my children were young, I used to say to them things like, eat your vegetables. And they could say, why? Because they're thinking, I don't really like the taste of Brussels sprouts. And my answer could be, um, well, the kale that we've put in front of you is high in potassium and magnesium, and your heart needs the magnesium to develop properly because a lack of magnesium can lead to these heart defects. That would mean nothing to my 
three-year-old who wants to know why I'm asking them to eat the kale. And I'm not sure it's always an adequate thing to say simply because I told you to. Though sometimes that should be enough. But we want our children to understand, and so we try to put it into language that they can fathom. So we say to them, because it will make you grow big and strong. Okay, that's a little bit better. Not sure it really helped my kids eat the kale, but at least the idea was there. Well, God not only gives us instructions, but he alerts us to the fact that these instructions are there for our good and then charges us with responsibility as we grow up and mature to understand and, and, and take joy in understanding why the things he told us are good for us. And that's what science does here. Now think about singing for a moment. If you're going to sing a song, do you know what it requires you to do? First of all, you've got to control your vocal apparatus. That's not simply your vocal cords. That's the diaphragm and the breathing. That's the breath that's coming out through those vocal cords. It's the shaping of the sounds from those vocal cords by the way you hold your mouth, your tongue, the roof of your mouth, your sinus and nasal passages, your lips, whether you put your tongue to the front of your teeth or to the top of your palate or down below, all of that vocal apparatus has to be controlled when you're singing. Let's go a step further. When you're singing, you've got to be able to perceive, listen and perceive, let it register, and recognize things like pitch. High note, low note. Rhythm. Or um, William Tell Overture, the um, shaving a haircut two bits. Okay? You've got to be able to, to perceive and recognize not only pitch, not only rhythm, but the structural components of a song. Verses, bridges, you may not even know the terms. You may not know any of those terms. But your brain still has to perceive and follow and do those things when you are singing. You don't have to do it as much when you're listening. You don't have to control your vocal apparatus when you're listening. But when you're singing, you do. When you're singing, you also have to have your brain continually monitoring what's going on. Your brain, you, you can't go to sleep at the wheel while you're singing. If everybody's singing together and you're singing and all of a sudden, you just kind of start doing something else. The singing is not going to be what the singing needs to be if you can sing at all. And so you've got all of this going on at the same time and you're not even conscious of it. You're just caught up in the singing. But I'll tell you from a scientific perspective, the, the complex process that I've just described requires neural circuits working all over your brain. This is not the kind of thing that's just one region of the brain. Singing requires neural circuitry out the wazoo. And so, the interaction of all of that in your brain that's happening helps shape your thoughts, it helps shape your actions, and it helps shape your feelings. Singing will affect the way you think. Singing will affect 
the way you act and singing will affect the way you feel. You want to feel happy? Sing a happy song. Want to feel sad? Sing a sad song. Want to be, feel romantic? Sing a romantic song. Want to march off to war with excitement? Sing John Philip Sousa. If you don't know that singing and music affects your thoughts and your actions and your feelings, then ask yourself, why is it every movie, every TV show, be they good or be they bad, has a soundtrack? Because you can be watching and that movie will tell you when you should be scared. By the music. That movie will tell you when you should expect something good to happen. By the music. You want the romantic moment? Don't simply look for the man or the woman to gaze longingly into the other's eyes. Listen to the music. Now, scientists know that we've got two hemispheres in our brains, and typically one hemisphere is dominant for language, uh, for math, etc. One hemisphere is more dominant typically for art, for things of creativity. But singing? Singing involves both sides of the brain. Because when you're singing, you're not just appreciating the music. You are using the linguistic side of your brain as well. Singing is a mathematical process, and you're using that as well. And all of this, your entire being, consciously and unconsciously, your brain is all caught up in singing. So when God commands us to sing to Him, He's calling us in our entirety as a human being to focus on Him, who He is, and what He's done. And that's why there's a biblical instruction to sing, by the way. I'm not saying that's the only reason, but that is a core reason why. Now with that, let's move to the second point. Let's talk about the historical practice, because here's the deal. History is fascinating on this subject. It takes all of our parts of our neural circuitry to sing, right? That's what I've already said scientifically. Well, here's a news flash for you. As we age, our neural circuits are not as pliable. It's more difficult to learn as you get older. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, you can, but it's not as easy. It's not as easy for me to memorize Bible verses at this age as it was earlier in my life. It's not as easy for me to learn a new language as it is for my one-year-old grandson to learn a language. Our neural circuits become less pliable. In fact, that's one reason a lot of neuroscientists will tell you, continue to develop different skills and continue to exercise your brain like a muscle as you get older. You 50, 60, 40, learn piano. Learn violin. Learn guitar. The process of learning some new habit, be it playing a violin or being it playing a guitar, or be it uh, playing a piano. It will develop new neural circuitry. 
Do crossword puzzles. It'll develop neural circuitry. Do Sudoku. Play bridge. Keep your mind engaged in growing and developing new neural circuitry. Because the tendency is to live in the forms of neural connections that have been made when we were younger. Did you know most studies indicate that if you ask people when the best music was, they typically will say music that within a year or two is when they were in high school. That is what polling results show over and over and over. That's not always the case. But more times than not, that's what we identify with. I mean, what, what is music? That changes based on who you ask. Some will tell you it's Beethoven. Dun, 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 dun. In his fifth symphony, it's beautiful. Some will tell you it's Debussy, Claude Debussy's Prelude to a Fawn. It's a gorgeous piece of music. Some will tell you it's Mozart. Dun, 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 dun. With all of his incredible flourishes. Some will say, no, <laughs> that's not music. Music is Kanye. Closed on Sunday, you're my Chick-fil-A. Number one with a lemonade. Some will say, no, it's the other yay. It's not uh, Kanye, it's Beyonce. Or some will say, it's the other A, it's uh, Dr. Dre. Some will tell you, some in the know will tell you what real music is. Bob Dylan, the Bob. Bob has a way with not only words, but a way with music. Um, he's got uh, uh, the song, oh, what is it? It's, uh, uh, I've seen love go by my door, never been this close before, never been so easy, are so slow, uh, been shooting in the dark too long, when something's not right, it's wrong, you're going to make me lonesome when you go. I mean, aside from that, he's got that line in there when he says, it always just hit me from below, and it goes up on below. I mean, that's just like classic music. But what happens is, as we age, we don't tend to like new things. Our brains are set with the neural circuitry we've already got. And we have our habits and we have our taste, and it's hard for those to change. I had a friend in high school at church in our youth group whose dad I thought was really neat because the dad said, there are three commitments he made to himself as a teenager. This dad would have been a teenager in the 1940s. Three commitments. Number one, he would always dress in contemporary style. Number two, I don't remember. Number three, he would always appreciate contemporary music. And he said he made it to his deathbed, always appreciating contemporary clothes. And he made it to 1964, always appreciating contemporary music. We don't tend to like new things, and that's okay. But we've got to watch out for confirmation bias, which is a mental short tr shortcut our brain takes on stuff. Confirmation bias, if you don't know what it is. Confirmation bias is our tendency to see and interpret evidence and, and ideas in a way that confirms what we already believed. So it's... it's um, you know, what is confirmation bias and why should I care? It's you addressing something saying, yep, that's what I thought. I got a good buddy who emails me all the time about politics. And he already believes that one particular party is a godless party that's going to lead America off the cliff to the left. 
and the other party is the party of the Lord. And every email he sends me is selected out of the news media to confirm what he believes already to be the case. Now, he's a really smart fella. And so he would take issue with this and he would tell me, I have just committed confirmation bias by reading his stuff that way. So, I don't know, I may have, but either way, We've got to be real careful because what we have a tendency to do is to come up with things to justify what we like and what we want. And you see that in the history of church music. So the church used to sing these chants. The church would sing chants and it would be uh, in Latin. I'm talking about the medieval church. And uh, it would be everybody singing the same note in unison. And so uh, uh, you would have a chant of Ubi Caritas, Ubi Caritas et Amor Deus Ibi Est. And it would just be everybody singing that note together. But then some people started putting harmony adding a second melody line, polyphony. And boy, that upset people because that wasn't the way it was done. And so they not only got upset, but they gave explanations to back up their upsetness. <laughs> Confirmation bias. Said, it destroys the unity of God. We're singing of God. God is one. So you don't do sing two different melody lines. That destroys the unity of God. In fact, Pope Leo IV, who reigned from 847 to 855, if you call the Pope reigning, for if you don't follow our right, that's the liturgy, in all its details in the sung parts, be advised we cast you out from communion. If you're going to sing this newfangled melody stuff with harmony, you're out of the church, baby. You're destroying the unity of God. Let's fast forward 400 years to Pope John the 22nd. He issues this edict in 1324. Certain practitioners of the new school who think only of the laws of measured time, he's talking about rhythm in singing, are composing new melodies of their own creation. So now he's got pitch involved with a new system of note values that they prefer to the ancient traditional music. We prohibit absolutely for the future that anyone should do such things. And it was illegal to have the devil in music. Diobolos in musica. And that specifically was the tritone. Do not take a C to an F sharp. You're saying, I don't even understand what this is. I'm not a musical person. Oh, yes, you do. You just don't know the words for it. Trust me. Have you ever seen West Side Story? West Side Story does the exact thing that the Pope said was illegal. It takes a note from a C and goes six steps from there into an F sharp. Leonard Bernstein, who wrote the music for, for West Side Story, does it over and over. One of the songs that, that makes it easiest to follow is Maria. The song Maria. And if you do read music, you'll see the most beautiful sound I ever heard Ma is on a C. That's the middle C. Re, that's the F sharp. You know it's sharp because the top line F, F sharp, goes Maria is C to an F sharp. That's, man, that'll get you kicked out of the Catholic Church like that. By the way, Jimi Hendrix does the same thing in Purple Haze would have gotten him kicked out of the Catholic Church in the 1200s also. I'm not sure he was really looking to attend, but here it is. See if you can hear this.
that C to an F sharp. Get you kicked out. Then along comes Martin Luther. Whoo! You want to get people upset, accuse Martin Luther of using beer melodies for the Lord. And most people get upset over that because they don't like the newfangled music that's going on now. And people who like the newfangled music going on now say, well, Martin Luther and the church. And so they'll write against it. I pulled up all these web articles. Martin Luther never used beer songs, beer melodies for the Lord. That's a misstatement. And then you start reading their article. And as they go through the article, they'll say, now it is true that he did sort of take some beer melodies and use them for the Lord, but he never did that. And I'm like... It is true, but it is. Yes, he did. He took common everyday melodies that people would sing in beer halls or any other place for that matter. And he wrote Christian lyrics to go with them. One of the most famous Martin Luther songs. A mighty fortress is our God. People still debate whether or not he wrote that melody. And you'll find strong opinions on both sides, but it clearly is a contemporary melody like people would have been using every day in a sing-along, which in Germany at the time happened generally in the beer halls. But you can just hear the German sloshing with their beer mugs. And he takes it and puts a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark, it's never failing. And it's just amazing. But we live in a culture, no, strike that. We live with brains that like what we like and don't like to change. And you see that historically over and over and over again almost in every generation. I don't want this to all be about history. I want to talk a little bit about the practical side of this. And I want to begin by telling us that, that worship and singing needs to focus on the target. We need to realize and focus our attention on who we're singing Two. Remember all of those instructions that I gave you from the Bible. The instructions that say, shout for joy to God, all the earth, sing the glory of His name, give to Him glorious praise, say to God, how awesome are your deeds. The direction of our praise and worship and singing needs to be to God. That should be our focus. Our focus should never be on entertainment. Our churches are not to be Broadway plays and spectaculars. Our worship teams and worship leaders and worship bands are not to be concert experiences. The Congregation gathers together in what is called a sanctuary, from the Latin word sanctus, which means holy. It's a place of holiness where we gather together to proclaim the holiness of God. Yet many of us have a tendency to treat it like an auditorium where we go and audit what's going on. And that's not what worship is. Worship is not that way. And when we sing, we are singing with our eyes on the target, spiritually at least, praising God. Now, when we sing, remember our song leaders are our song followers. This is not a lounge act. This is not us becoming, it, it is never, ever about us. It is always and only about God. See, 
Worship, singing in worship, is proclaiming honor to God. That's what it is. It's shouting for joy to God. It's giving to Him glorious praise. It's saying to God, how awesome are your deeds. It's worshiping Him, singing praises to Him, singing praises to His name. Worshiping is giving God His rightful place. I want to show you Matthew 21, 15, and 16. It's one of my favorite worship passages in the Bible. The chief priests and the scribes saw what Jesus was doing, and the children, they saw the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the Son of David. And they were indignant. Now we got to break this down for a minute. Why are they indignant? Hosanna. Hosanna is not um, just a word. It was an idiomatic expression at the time in the language called Aramaic, which was the common language of the people, but it had a meaning. It's actually two words. The na at the end means please, or more piously, we pray thee, but it's please. And the hosea at the beginning, hoshanu, is, is save us. Hosanna means, please save us. So the ch children are crying out to Jesus, please save us. And it made the priests and the scribes indignant. They're all upset. And they said to Jesus, do you hear what they're saying? Do you hear they're asking you to save them? And Jesus says, you bet. Didn't you read your Psalms? Out of the mouths of infants and nursing babes, you've prepared praise. Worship is giving God His rightful place. Worship is coming together and singing to God to the glory of His name, His resume, His CV, who He is, what He's done. It's giving Him His rightful place. And His rightful place for us is Savior. Because we're the ones who need to be saved. And I want to tell you, if you come into the presence of God and you begin to see God for who He is, it's going to transform you as you sing. Remember, singing affects the way you think, it affects the way you act, and it affects the way you feel. It involves your whole brain. And, and it involves all of you. And when you come into the presence of God and you begin to see Him for who He is, and you get a glimpse of a hangnail of His glory. Your first reaction is probably going to be, what right do I have to even behold the glory of this one, much less try to proclaim it? Because you will feel the utter worthlessness of yourself to do such a thing. But the psalmist says that strength is found in the presence of God. And the writer of Hebrews says that Jesus has prepared our entry into the presence of God. Because what we will discover is not only our own impotence at, 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 at magnifying the Lord, not only our unworthiness at being in His presence and being called to praise, but we'll understand that that has been washed in the blood of the Lamb and that we now have strength through the Spirit of God 
to be into his presence. And when we come into his presence with our whole mind, he will transform the way we think. He will transform the way we act. And he will transform the way we feel. It's not surprising God's instruction to sing is not because he needs us to. Like everything else in life, it's because we need to. And so he calls us to sing congregationally. We've got the Psalms that talk about us singing congregationally. We've got examples of singing congregationally. Look at Revelation 4.8. Four living creatures, these are angels, full of eyes all around, day and night, never cease to say, to sing. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And this pa passage continues in verse 9. Whenever they're giving glory and honor and thanks to Him who's seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, 24 elders fall down before Him seated on the throne and worship Him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne. I love that. When I was young, we used to have people who tell us, you're going to get you know, jewels in your crown when you're in heaven. You're going to get a crown when you're in heaven. And that's wonderful and good. As long as we understand not only that, but we understand what we're going to do with those crowns. We're going to throw them down before the Lord because we're not worthy for those. We cast our crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory, honor, power. You're the one. See, this is his name. You created all things. By your will, they existed and were created. This is who you are. This is your name. You're the one who's worthy. And so we've got those marvelous examples and congregational singing is incredible, but also personal singing. There is a time and place in our lives you need a personal soundtrack to God. My thoughts for the day for this coming week. My plan is each day to give you a song for the soundtrack of your life. One of the members of our class, Lorraine Hibbert, sends me a song every day. Song every day for my personal walk with God. Examples of singing. Look at this individual example from Job 1, 20 and 21. Job, his world's fallen apart. Kids, dead. Finances, gone. Crops, livestock, out of there. Job arose. He tore his robe. He shaved his head. He fell on the ground and worshiped. And his worship was saying, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I'll return. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That means blessed be God who gives, and blessed be God who takes away. So that's uh, an idea of uh, practical exercises, a little bit of this. We're going to talk about it more next week and worship and, and dig into it a little bit more and dig into the ideas of worship. Great Greek word, pros kineo, to worship. Great Hebrew equivalent, hishtachavu, to worship. We're going to talk about that and dig into that. Here's the key. Remember, we're doing that next week at 9.30. 9.30 Central Time if you want to be there live for the class. But in the meantime, aside from that, if you want some information that we can give you, if you'd like us to email you our announcements, get you on those video thoughts for the day, including the song each day that you can add to your personal soundtrack of your life, shoot us an email at wantmore at biblical-literacy.org. And that comes to our class leadership at Champion Forest Baptist Church. Pastor Brent Johnson gets those, passes them on to me, so I've got a chance to read them as well. We would love to be in dialogue with you. Coming September 20th, don't forget, it's a new series. Be praying for me in that because I'm doing the prep work for it now. And pray that I'll do a good job. But in the meanwhile, let me pray for you. 
Father, I pray your blessings on everyone who hears this message, that we'll share it with others who need to hear it, and that we will all focus on finding you and praising you, not just with our words, but in song, getting that whole mind involved before you as you transform us into who we can be. All glory, honor, and praise to you who sits on the throne forever and ever, the God of love, the God of mercy, our Lord and God and Savior, Jesus. Amen.